Thank you everybody uh, for coming. I know there are a lot of really interesting talks at this time, so I definitely appreciate you um, choosing to join this one. Um, so today I'll be talking about two topics that are, um, that, that, that are really something I've spent a lot of time doing and um, are deeply, deeply meaningful to me, site reliability engineering and networking. Um, over the last decade or so um, in my professional career, I've been working as a kind of a site reliability engineer and, and kind of following what this role has turned into. Um, so spending a lot of time coding and spending a lot of time on Linux. Um, but for the last six years, I've been uh, working at the intersection of those two principles, coding and systems, operating systems, and working on networking teams. So this means load balancing, content delivery, et cetera. Um, so with that, um, you know, today, my, my three kind of goals for this talk are to one, to share some of my experiences as a site reliability engineer, two, to give you guys some ammunition and to some fundamental knowledge about networking that you can apply to your infrastructure and hopefully you know, help things um, you know, improve uh, reliability um, from a networking perspective. And three, to hopefully you know, get you excited about the, the site reliability engineering role and networking. Um, you know, as an operating, or as a sysadmin, you know, you kind of think of networking as this other thing, but you know, in 2019, so much of the things that we do rely on networks that it's really important for us to have fundamental knowledge in this space. So just to give you a quick introduction about myself, um, I started at Ohio State in 2006 uh, as an undergraduate in computer science and engineering. Wasn't a very good student, had a very average GPA. I probably wouldn't get into the engineering program today uh, with that GPA. But um, you know, I spent a lot of time you know, in the classes doing the work, um, but it wasn't really until I found Python that I got really excited about computer science and building things, and kind of my whole world expanded. So in 2010, uh, I graduated and I joined Nationwide as a Linux system administrator. So we managed a few thousand Linux servers at the time. Um, I was doing a lot of sysadmin work, which was great, I loved it, and I was writing a lot of Python to automate a lot of the tools that we were doing. So, Things were going really well until um, uh, September 2012, I got hit up by a recruiter on LinkedIn from Facebook. They asked me if I wanted to interview. I didn't think I had a chance in hell at getting the job. And um, seven interviews and uh, two flights out to Menlo Park in California, uh, I ended up accepting that role um, where I spent the next few years uh, at Facebook as a production engineer. Um, so I'll go through a couple of the different teams I was on in just a moment. Um, but uh, earlier this year, I wanted to make my way back to Ohio, and staying with Facebook in the role that I was in was not a possibility uh, here in, in Ohio. So I joined Netflix, and I was working as a site reliability engineer on the CDN team. So making sure videos, those movies when you press play, get delivered to your phone or TV really quickly. Up until last month, um, I decided to make a move again, uh, and I joined a startup here in, in Columbus called eFuse. Um, and I'll talk about those in just a moment. So, just to kind of give you a really quick overview of my time at Facebook, uh, I started on the site reliability operations team. So this team really didn't own anything except the general reliability of Facebook. So I got to take that coding and the operating systems experience I had and work on a really big infrastructure with hundreds of thousands of servers. And uh, so that gave me a really good kind of cross section of, or, or the addition of working with distributed systems. And in that, even that time, really massively distributed systems. About a year and a half into that role, we did what I think every engineer or everything I tried to do on a team is automate ourself, myself out of my job. Um, that's what our team essentially did, is we automated a lot of the manual things that we were doing. And I got the, the decision or the choice to join a different team. So I chose the traffic team. And the traffic team's job at Facebook is to make sure no matter where you are in the world, when you open up your phone and you're on Instagram or Facebook or WhatsApp, we know where you are in the world relative to all the servers that we have in the world. And I don't mean this by GPS location. We didn't care where you were physically. We cared where you were on the internet. We wanted, we need, we built maps of the entire internet every two minutes of, so we knew exactly where you are relative latency uh, to everywhere else in the world. So I spent about four years on that team and I focused a lot on the CDN, the content delivery, photos and video delivery. Um, and then last, the last year at Facebook, um, I joined the Net S Network Systems team, which um, Facebook's infrastructure is really big. They actually they have over a million servers, and the network is really big. So they do a lot of SDN. So the Net Network Systems team spent uh, time building the control plane to handle the data plane of the network. So uh, in February, I joined uh, Netflix again as a site reliability engineer on the CDN team. So when you press play, our job was to map you to wherever you were relative to the movie that you wanted to watch to the server. So they'd be right here in Columbus. Um, so, and it's called the Open Connect uh, Appliance. Um, so cool. So 
Last month, uh, I decided to leave Netflix for uh, a company called eFuse. So the premise of eFuse is um, a built around esports, and there are over 160 colleges and universities in the U.S. that are have varsity esports teams or build, building varsity esports programs. And the kind of problem we're trying to solve is helping people have their professional digital gaming resume online and helping them get opportunities like scholarships, jobs, internships in the esports industry. Even Ohio State has an esports um, arena and they're giving full ride scholarships um, for esports for people to come play. So that's uh, so I joined them um, and there we have, uh, uh, you can see the website down there. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that and it's a really, really great team so far. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is why did you move back to Ohio? I always knew I was gonna move back at some point. I didn't plan to stay out on the West Coast in California for almost seven years that I did. But I will say that things have changed a lot between 2012 and 27, 2019, um, when I moved back just a few months ago in June. And it's really, really exciting. Like I loved hearing all the stories of the startups who you know, were really successful. You know, there's tons and tons of, uh, of different examples um, that I could give. But I will say that being out there, it was just really amazing to see how much things have blossomed here in Columbus and just the Midwest in general. And I was really excited to come back and be a, be a part of that. And that's another reason why I decided to make the move. Um, I wanted to spend more of my brain cycles and energy and make an impact here in Columbus versus working in a company out west. So what is site reliability engineering? Um, if you go and ask 12 different people what they think site reliability engineering is, um, I imagine you're going to get probably 12 different answers. Um, but I'm going to share with you, um, you know, my experience as a site reliability engineer and kind of my thoughts on you know, what the makeup and the composition is of this role. So the first and foremost, a site reliability engineer is a hybrid software slash systems engineer. You need to be able to code. You need to be able to write great code, well-tested, um, you know, well-structured code. And you also need to have a pretty solid understanding of operating systems. So understanding as we write those applications, how are they interfacing with the operating system? How are you know, they using memory, you know, system calls, you know, all these different things. Like you need to have just a really under good understanding of, of application and software development. So the, the second big piece as a site reliability engineer is generally they have a, a, an emphasis on kind of the fundamental building blocks of infrastructure and distributed systems. Um, I think a really tangible way to think about this is they generate, if you go to look at AWS and look at all those services that are available, a site reliability engineer is to generally have a good idea of, given a concept, how would you use those different components, whether you're using AWS or you're building those things in-house you know, in um, to, to accomplish it. So really focusing on the fundamental building blocks of building out applications. Next is they have a focus on reliability and scalability and just really instrumentation of the application itself. Um, so you know, knowing when there are issues, knowing when there are regressions when new code goes out. Like these are all responsibilities of a site reliability engineer and ideally building tooling and scaffolding around this so you can determine th these things automatically instead of just accidentally going and finding them. And then lastly, in this role, the site reliability engineer generally goes and partners with software engineering teams to help develop highly reliable software. You know, many of us are, you know, work on websites, that we have applications. SREs come in to help, you know, build things the right way and make sure we're doing them in a scalable way so that we can think about, uh, we don't have to think about scaling issues, you know, a couple years out. So when I think about the skill sets that I look for in a site reliability engineer, it kind of com it comes down to four things. So the first is operating systems. Again, you need to have a solid fundamental understanding of operating systems, whether it's Linux, Windows, you know, whatever. Secondly, it's coding. Again, you have to be able to code, you have to be able to build things, contribute, and you know, build a lot of the automations around the things that you're doing. The third is distributed systems. Almost every, you know, many of the applications that you guys all run are distributed systems by nature. They're, they're talking to other services, microservices, et cetera, and understanding the building blocks of building distributed systems. And then the fourth is networking. And this is what I'm here to talk about today, is everything that you guys run probably, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, probably depends on the network at some point. So just having a really a good understanding, even fundamental understanding of the network really helps you, know, you understand the systems as a whole and help you debug issues a lot easier. So when it comes to actually like, you know, what people bring to the table as SRE, it really depends. You know, everybody brings different skill sets. You don't want everybody to be an expert in operating systems or networking. Every, you know, just like any team, everybody brings different things to the table. So it really depends on, um, you know, you know, everybody brings something a little bit different. So, you know, this kind of pie can be broken up in many different ways. So what isn't SRE? SRE isn't DevOps. Um, I, I, I view SRE as an evolution of DevOps. So we are a team that partners with software engineers. We're not the 
on-call team, the operations team, we don't handle the like, manage, like it doesn't get thrown over the wall to us. You know, we work with the software engineering teams. So it is DevOps in that way as they also are on call and fix code when it's broken. Um, so yeah, um, and, and I get asked this a lot, like are SREs unicorns? Uh, and the answer is no, like SREs aren't unicorns. They aren't good at everything they do. I think SRE is just a different role that we, we're seeing a lot more of and we haven't seen of in the past. So some of the things that they can bring to the table and do kind of looks like magic at some, uh, in some cases. Um, but if you do find a unicorn, I encourage you to either hire him or her as soon as possible or shoot me an email and then uh, I'll hire them to my team. So just a really quick mention, um, production engineering. So this is Facebook's equivalent of the site reliability engineering role. Um, before I joined Facebook, I didn't know this, this role existed. And but going into the company as really being focused on coding and operating systems, I, I didn't realize, um, like it really helped me kind of just ex accelerate in my career really rapidly. Um, and it was really, one of the things that was really gratifying to me is when I would do interviews, I would tell people what I do and what my role is. And they would say, I didn't even know that existed. Like that sounds exactly like what I want to do. And that's really how I felt this role is in the site reliability engineering role. It's made for me. Like this is what I like doing. I don't want to make a website pretty. I want to make sure a website scales to tens of millions of people. So cool. So what is networking? How many of you have applications that run in the cloud? Okay, a lot of you, cool. Awesome. How many of you have users that interact with those applications? Cool. Almost everybody. So today I'm not going to talk about the things that are in the cloud, the networking constructs there. That's for many, you can make many different talks about that, and there probably has been some um, even here today. But this talk is going to be about all the things between that user and the cloud. When you just go to you know, um, you know, google.com, you are interacting with almost every single protocol and distributed system up there right now. You're hitting routers, you're you know, using IP, v4, hopefully v6, probably v6. Um, but it's just amazing that the internet actually worked. There's so many distributed systems um, that are involved. It's, it's actually fascinating. Um, so cool. And obviously this is important from a site liability engineer because you want to make sure your users can hit your site reliably. Well, you want to have all those nines and you want to be able to be able to put that on a presentation that your site is reliable. So we're going to quickly go through a bunch of different topics today, um, and we'll just kind of dive right in. So this, most of this talk is going to be around this command and everything that happens. All we're going to do is curl patrickshuff.com. That's it. We're going to talk about all the pieces that are involved there. Awesome. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to, whoops, went back. So we need to figure out how do we resolve patrickshuff.com. Like that's just a name, it means nothing to the computers. We need to turn that into an IP address. So that's DNS resolution. And since it's 2019, we're always using IPv6. Step two is we need to establish a TCP connection. So we actually need to connect with that server. Uh, we need to establish a connection with them. We'll talk about that in detail. The next is it's 2019, every piece of, every packet that's on the internet needs to be encrypted. So we're gonna talk about TLS establishment. And lastly, we're going to talk about HTTP really briefly. It's 2019, so everybody's using HTTP2, um, I'm sure. So, and then lastly, we'll talk about internet routing. How does the internet actually work? How do the routers talk to each other? What are the protocols involved there? We've got a lot of things to cover. So cool. So what is DNS? DNS is the domain name server. Actually, I do want to preface real quick. I'm not expecting all this to stick. I will post these, um, the, these, these slides later. And a lot of them have commands so that you can kind of go into each layer and kind of run things on your servers to kind of see what's going on. So I'll post these and they'll be, they'll be hopefully useful to go back and reference later. So domain, DNS, domain name servers, really old. Um, uh, uh, the way that it translates .coms names to IP addresses. It's been around forever. It's amazing. It's lasted the tech, test of time. A lot of different record types. Quad A is IPv6, single A is IPv4, MX records um, is for your mail servers, et cetera. So the first thing that curl is going to do approximately, it's going to do a get adder info. So it needs to get the address from the name that you actually give it. Um, so you can use host there, or I gave a, a quick Python example. Um, so what that's going to do, uh, I think that, that, that function is in libc. Um, the first thing, one of the things it's going to do is go into resolve.conf to figure out what are your name servers? Who does it need to talk to to go resolve this? So in this case, we have localhost as our name server. So that means we're running some type of local recursive DNS resolver, bind, unbound, um, et cetera. So it's going to send that request to that local name server. So your laptop or your server is going to actually go out 
and talk to one of the root name server, the root DNS name servers. So these are servers that are scattered around the internet. They use um, a single IP. They're static. Um, so this is a file that's on your computer, and they're using UDP and Anycast to hit one of these servers around the internet. And it's asking the question, what is the quad A record for patrickchef.com? It says, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you who the top level domain is .com or com dot, and it will send me to their servers. So then you, it gets a response, gtld servers.net. So the next thing it's gonna do is gonna go out to the com name servers that it just, uh, the response that it just got. It says, I don't know who patrickchef.com is, but I know the NS record or the name servers for patrickchef.com. So it then sends that back to my computer. And finally, we send the, that request to patrickchef.com name servers, and then we get back a quad A record. So awesome. We've now got back an IP address. Um, here's some different commands. And again, I'll send this out um, for you to kind of run through these uh, on, your, on, your, on your own time um, and some different configs as well. So cool. So now that we've actually have an IP address, we need to establish a connection to it. So before we get into what TCP is, let's do um, uh, a TCP IP review. So to kind of go back to, to school, um, we'll go over the OSI model. It's kind of broken in terms of how things map today, but um, it's OK for the purposes of this talk. So the first layer is the physical layer. So this is either the wireless protocol, the physical copper, the fiber that you're using, um, layer one protocol. The second layer is uh, the, um, the data link layer. Um, commonly on the internet, it's pretty ubiquitous that Ethernet is, is the protocol we use. And this is what we mean when we talk about the local area network, the LAN, the switches, are switching um, frames on the Ethernet uh, layer, on layer two. The third layer, layer three, is the IP layer. So this is IPv6, IPv4, um, ICMP is also layer three. But this is what we mean when we say the WAN, the wide area network. This is the packet that actually traverses the internet and stays intact. Layer four is TCP. So this is our, our, our control, the transport protocols, or uh, in, in cases of the internet today, generally it's TCP or UDP. So the transmission control protocol or the user datagram protocol. We'll talk about TCP in just a moment. So layer five, um, you can kind of fit TLS and sockets in there, presentation, kind of fit ASCII. Um, but layer seven is the, the other important one, is our application layer protocol. So FTP, HTTP, you know, DNS, these, li these live at the layer seven uh, layer. So to quickly go through each of these, um, the ethernet header, um, this is where you have your MAC addresses. So these are the addresses assigned to your network interface, your NIC, um, and you can see some commands there to kind of check things out uh, on layer two. So the IPv6 header um, is, you know, very, it's pretty straightforward, but you have a bunch of different, uh, 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 your source address, your destination address, and a couple different fields to, to, um, to make your packet, just to kind of give it some context and for the routers along the way to determine where uh, that packet goes. A um, couple commands down there. So layer four is the TCP header. Um, so again, this is the connection um, between your device, your client, and your server. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple of these different things, but the important ones are the source port, the destination port, um, and we'll talk about flags in just a little bit as well. Um, and then finally, layer seven. So this is where your application layer actually uh, lives. So once the actual get request, that curl command, this is the actual thing that finally wants to get to and ask for a resource on my web server, and then the server will respond. So kind of putting this all together, you have this IPv6 packet, which encapsulates a TCP segment, which encapsulates your application data. This is how the internet works. These are how the protocols are put together. Any questions so far? Cool. So what is TCP? TCP is the Transmission Control Protocol. It's um, the common uh, stateful protocol that we use um, on the internet today. And it has a couple really nice properties to it as the writer of the application. Um, it guarantees in-order in order delivery. So everything that is sent, in the order that is sent, the receiver will receive that as long as there wasn't, um, the connection didn't die. Um, so it's a really important thing. You don't have to think about reordering segments on or reordering data on the application side. If a packet gets lost on the internet, TCP is responsible for retransmitting that data. So it kind of goes back to the in-order delivery and makes sure all data is actually delivered as well. Um, and there's a bunch of <clears throat> fancy algorithms to, uh, to handle that and um, make sure it's utilizing the internet as, uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, and there's a couple other nice properties about TCP uh, that we won't get into. 
Um, so one important uh, thing about TCP is the flags. Um, so there, there's seven bits, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, um, of flags that are one bit each um, in the TCP header that I'll provide some more context around the connection. So it allows, does things like, allows the client and the server to synchronize data so they can establish that connection and be on the same you know, page essentially. It also provides additional useful context um, for the application sides to, um, you know, if, if, if one side needs to back off, um, TCP can help uh, send that to the other side. So let's talk about the TCP three-way handshake. So we have a client, we just hit run curl, we know the IP address, we just opened a socket. Now we need to actually see what happens uh, at the TCP layer. So the first thing that happens is the sender sends a SYN packet. So this means synchronize. And basically, these are, they're synchronizing a few variables like the, um, the sequence number, the, um, the MSS, which is the maximum segment size, which is kind of related to MTU, um, and just to kind of exchange a few variables. Sorry, a few, yeah, variables is fine. Um, so the server side then sends back a SYN as well, and it also sends back an ACK, which is an acknowledgement of the SYN that came in. So again, it's sending its MSS, it's sending its sequence number, and then finally, the sender sends back the, the last act, and then it sends the application data. So this is great. You know, we finally have a connection. Um, but what's interesting here is, say these the client and the sender, the client sorry the sender the client and the server are about 28 milliseconds away, which is approximately the distance of the U.S. Just to make this request takes 104 milliseconds. So that doesn't sound like a long time. Um, for you know a single you know a single packet, but it actually you know, that's a tenth of a second, and that's just crossing the U.S. This isn't even crossing an ocean. So this is actually you know, when you think about you know having a worldwide globally distributed uh, infrastructure, like these are things you really have to think about. So cool. Um, here's a few commands to to open up sockets you know in Python or a couple ways to do it in Bash on the command line. Um, I, I threw in a few TCP debugging here. Um, you know, TCP is uh, uh, it's you know it's a wire protocol. So there are some really great tools. You know, TCP dump and T Shark to do this on the command line, um, as well as Wireshark's a really great way to have a really beautiful graphic user interface to to go through and, and figure out what's happening at the TCP level. Uh, I've used this many many times. Um, SS is also the new Netstat. It's way better. And um, it's also a really great way to see all the connections that are happening on your server. And if you want historical data, um, NetStat's really good to have, uh, not, not historical, but kind of a snapshot in time of a ton of different me uh, metrics about TCP, UDP, uh, ICMP, and SAR Sysstat is also a really great way to collect stats regularly about uh, your system. So let's talk about TCP socket states. Um, so when you open a new socket, on your system, it goes through a series of states. And there's actually a state diagram, I'll show it in just a second, it's really, really busy. But you basically each side of this, the, the sender and the receiver go through a different set of socket states. Um, and while this is kind of um, you know, going in the weeds a little bit, this is actually really interesting for a couple of reasons. Is one is like when you're debugging an application issue um, and you're like, there's gotta be a networking problem, like my packets are getting lost. Um, it's really useful to understand the socket states and, and like if say you have a whole bunch of um, in, you know, in this fin weight too, uh, and we'll, we'll go through this in just a second. I'll, I'll show you this and then I'll, I'll mention that story. So like here, our, our socket on the client side, the fin is sent, so that's the state that it's in. Once it's established, it goes into established state. And then once the client starts closing the connection, it goes through these different states here. So one issue I've ran into in the past is there's a whole bunch of connections. The server just stopped working. There's a whole bunch of connections in FinWait 2 because the server was never closing the connection. It never actually did a close on that socket. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to think about um, you know, socket states and, and debugging different types of, uh, uh, of networking issues uh, because it can provide a lot of really great context around what's happening at the network level with your application. And this is the uh, the TCP state diagram. Again, it's really busy. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's you know, it's all it's. You just check out that link. Um, it's it's interesting to kind of see the progression and how everything goes. But um, um, hopefully, you don't have to dive into that too much. Um, and again, some more commands for um, debugging TCP sockets um, that I've used uh, pretty regularly in the past. Cool. Any questions? 
Awesome. So now that we've resolved our um, resolved an IP address, we've established TCP. We need to establish TLS. So TLS is the um, transport layer security, um, which is pretty ubiquitous on the internet uh, today. So we, when you type in HTTPS, it's actually establishing, establishing TLS under the hood for you. Um, so it provides a couple of really nice properties um, that are useful um, when you have when um, anybody can you know pretty much hijack your traffic. The first one is encryption. So it makes sure every byte, every bit that goes over the wire is encrypted, um, so that nobody can you know look and see the, the that your credit card information is going over that. The second really important was is authentication. So when you go and hit patrickchef.com, there's a certificate there that's signed by a certificate authority that validated that I own that site, that the server that I have is behind that IP address. So it allows the clients and the servers to do authentication, and it can even do mutual authentication too in your server setup. If you want your server to authenticate the client, you can do that as well. It's all built into, into TLS. And then the third and last piece is integrity. So it makes sure that while your stuff's encrypted, you verify who's on the other side, that nobody can mess with any bits in flight and corrupt your data or inject things that shouldn't be there. Um, so, again, you know, there's um, some really great, uh, again, certificate authorities, you know, DigiCert VeriSign, VeriSign Let's Encrypt, um, really important. Yes, I got a slide for one of you guys here in just a second. So, all right, so now let's do the TLS handshake. We already know the three-way TCP handshake, SYN, SYNAC, and ACK. Next, we'll start the, the client hello. So this is the client sends a client hello with a couple different TLS parameters. Um, and essentially what the client and server, and server will send back the server hello. Essentially they're just, um, the client's sending the parameters that it supports, the server's sending back their mutually agreed upon ciphers uh, and, and encryption schemes that they're using. And the server will also send its, its certificate as well. Um, one interesting thing, you know, that, that's, uh, when you look at these connections is ALPN. So ALPN is application layer protocol negotiation. So, um, this is something that you don't think about a lot, but when you do a curl-v on patrickchef.com, you'll see that the client says, hey, I support HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. So you're actually um, negotiating, your client servers are negotiating the next protocol in the TLS header. Um, it's kind of cool and something to, to think about if you're trying to debug, why aren't my connections HTTP 2? Make sure ALPN is being sent by the client. So cool. So um, then the server and the, the um, sorry, the client and the server then do a key exchange. So they're either doing RSA or Diffie-Hellman um, key exchange, at which point the client can finally send that GET request, finally get to what they were actually wanting to do in the first place. So again, thinking about this, these client and server being 28 milliseconds away, just to do a simple GET request takes 224 milliseconds, which is a quarter of a second just for a single request. Now when you guys are building these really massive, complex websites, you know, with have tons of images and, and all this data coming in, it's, it takes a long time. Like, and especially if you think about things like head of line blocking, um, you need to have multiple, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, the point is, TLS adds a lot of overhead to your connections, but it's important, we have to do it, it's 2019. So again, so again, TLS adds a lot of overhead. Um, some, some different things to think about, uh, with TLS is supporting ticket resumption so that the clients and the servers can have, um, the server will send the client a ticket so they can skip one of the, the back and forth handshakes. Um, there's things like TCP fast open so that they can actually send data in that first, the SYN packet. Um, and there's different other things, and other, other things as well. Another thing that everybody needs to have on their website is HSTS, so hyper um, HTTP strict transport security. So what that does, is when you go to patrickchef.com and you just go to the port 80 that first time, or you do that every time, somebody can redirect you to another site and you don't realize it. HSTS is a header that you can set on your web server so that every time, that first time that they go there, it sets a header so the server knows next time you always use HTTPS, you always use TLS. So nobody can you know, hijack your, your website and redirect. Um, so that's something that's super important. Um, cool. Um, any questions? Totally, yeah. So, so the, the comment was, as long as you get to it to the first time. I, yeah, yeah, it, you know, but it's important to, to have there. But yeah, if, if you're on a brand new website, web browser, and, nobody, and you've never been there, then yeah, it's still, it's still possible. It's a good point. 
So a few commands here just to kind of debug TLS, um, make sure the server is doing the right thing, and I added a Python example there as well. Um, so a quick aside, uh, instead of doing debug on the, the command line, SSL Labs is fantastic. You guys should all go, any website you own, go punch your stuff in there and make sure you get an A+. I wouldn't have put this up here if I didn't have an A+. Plus, but, um, and it gives you tons of detail about your server. It's fantastic. It's fantastic, and it makes sure that you guys, everything you have is up to snuff security-wise. Um, it's, it's awesome. And then for whoever yelled boo about Let's Encrypt, if you don't have TLS, sorry, if you don't have SSL certs, Let's Encrypt is amazing. They allow you to have them for free. You don't have to pay a buttload of money to DigiCert or Verisign to get these certificates. It's entirely free, super, what's that? Or your money back. Or your money back, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great, it's, um, it, it's, and it's so easy to do. CertBot is, is ridiculously easy. Even so many web servers now just do it automatically, so. So now let's, we've actually, we've DNS resolution, TCP, established TLS. Now we actually need, get to send the requests that we wanted to send. So I'm not gonna go deep into HTTP 1 and 2. I'm just gonna mention a few thing, things. HTTP 1's been around for a while. Um, it's kind of, you know, HTTP, you know, post, get, puts. Like we have all these verbs for different things that we can do. Um, there's many downsides to HTTP 1 though. Um, the first is head of line blocking. And what head of line blocking is, is when you send a request, an HTTP request, you can't send another one on that same TCP connection until that other one comes back. So to get around this, what's commonly done in browsers is they'll open multiple TCP connections to your server and send those requests and kind of multiplex them over the different connections. Um, but it's still a problem with HTTP 1. Um, and, but uh, yeah, so the evolution of HTTP 1 is um, HTTP 2. And we can thank Google for this. Uh, they, the previous name was Speedy, um, but they've been working on this for a while. And not to go into too many details, but instead of being an ASCII protocol, it's now a binary protocol. And it's a framed protocol, meaning that you can, it's no, it's no longer, uh, it no longer suffers from head of line blocking. With a single TCP connection, you can send multiple requests. And it has different channels or streams. I don't remember the exact terminology, but it allows you to get around head of line blocking. Um, so it's, it's really nice. And there's a bunch of, Really awesome fancy features that HTTP2 has as well. You can like send things from the server. Um, you can push promises. It's pretty cool. Um, so definitely look into HTTP2 as well. Cool. Um, different, you know, debugging. Curl V gives you tons of information. And if you're really into the GUI stuff, Postman's a really cool application for helping you debug uh, HTTP requests on your, you know, your API server, your web server, whatever. It gives you makes it really easy to programmatically do really complex things that you wouldn't want to do in curl. Cool, any questions, comments? Cool. So <clears throat> next up, we'll talk about internet routing and the internet architecture. So how does the internet actually work? So the first, um, when we talk about how the internet works, the first topic and protocol has to be BGP. Um, BGP is the border gateway protocol and its job is, it's kind of the, it's, its job is to give into routers, negotiate routes, um, negotiate between them where they can get to. Um, and I'll, I'll show that in an example in just a moment. Um, but BGP is kind of the backbone, the protocol of the entire internet. It's really insecure and it's amazing the internet even works because anybody can BGP, BGP hijack at any point in time and it happens all the time, sadly. Um, it's, um, and it's not a perfect protocol. It's very eventually consistent and um, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it, but here we are. So let's give an example and say we're Ohio State. We're the only place in the world, well, not, we're not the only place in the world. Um, we have a bunch of researchers doing some really cool stuff and then we have a bunch of students and researchers like consuming that. So we've built this really big local area network and everybody's exchanging information and life's really, really good. Then comes along Indiana University, and they have a bunch of researchers doing cool research, a bunch of clients consuming that within their network, and life's good. But then they want to collaborate. They want to, they want to you know, be able to share information. So how do they do this? And the answer is the internet. Um, this is not why the internet was built, but um, you know, this is just a, a contrived example, but basically allowing different entities with diverse locations exchange information online. So the first thing that they have to do to, um, to pull this off, to be able to connect their networks is 
acquire an ASN. So an ASN is an autonomous system number. Um, and this is my shirt, cover your AS. It's autonomous system. Pretty, yeah, pretty lame joke. Um, but basically every big organization that is on the internet and you have routers physically connecting to the internet will have an ASN. Does anybody here have an ASN? Cool, what is it? Cool, what's yours? Oh, okay, no, that's all good. There's a really awesome resource online called PeeringDB if you wanna go check up you know, somebody's ASN, um, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, awesome, so the next thing you're gonna do is, um, so here we have, they each have their ASN, AS, I should have asked who knows Ohio State's ASN. Um, I would not have known them. Um, so Ohio State's 159, so these numbers get really big, they get up into um, like the hundreds of thousands, so Ohio State and Indiana were really early on in the internet game to acquire their ASN so early, so that's kind of cool. Um, so the next thing they need to do is put up routers, border routers, um, on their networks and connect them up. So here, Ohio State just put a router here, and then this is the routing table. So we'll just assume right now um, that their routing table, table is, this is the only thing in their routing, or this, these are the routes that are available in their network, these two slash 16s, and this is their external routing table. So then Indiana comes in and puts a router up, and they have their own routing table as well and it's empty for externally. So then they physically run a cable across the US, across the ground, across a bunch of farmland, and then they establish a BGP session. So BGP's entire job is to announce between these routers, all these routes here are now in the routing table. So if any client within Indiana's network needs to go to one of these places, it knows it needs to go to this router, and this, it knows where, this router now knows where to send that over here. That's essentially all that BGP does. Obviously, there's way more to it than that, but that's really what it comes down to. Um, awesome. So now Ohio State and Indiana are up and running. They're sharing information. And now Illinois wants to come in. Um, so they run some more cables, some copper fiber, and they do the same thing. They, they establish BGP, and now these routes are being uh, shared amongst all of them. Then Ohio University rolls in and, and, and hooks up. Cool. So then we have a bunch of people outside, like all these researchers, like I wanna be able to access this stuff from home. Um, how do I do that? And then that's where internet service providers come in, is internet service providers are who we pay to connect up to the internet, to the backbone of the internet, essentially, and connect up to all these different you know, networks. Um, so we're paying them a bunch of money, and that's great, and then you know, it just kind of balloons from there. And like this is how the internet looks today. It's just a really big, Distributed network, um, again, it's amazing that it even works, um, and a lot of times it doesn't, but um, it's really cool. So, you know, everybody's announcing BGP routes and, and everybody sees the, the full internet generally. So when you, you know, you say you're this client down here and you wanna reach this server, you know, your packet is gonna travel, you know, whatever way BGP says. BGP is not the most efficient protocol. It's not gonna guarantee the most efficient path, and I actually guarantee you, you're gonna take probably not the most efficient path. But that's just the way the internet works. It does work. And um, so, yeah, your packet hopefully eventually gets there. Cool. So, internet exchanges. So instead of everybody just running cable across the US or across oceans to other networks, um, they, we've established internet exchanges around the world so that people can just run their fiber to a centralized point and everybody can just connect up within these, um, these internet exchanges. Um, does anybody know the internet exchanges in Ohio? Do we have any in Columbus? Cologics. What's that? Cologics. Cologics, yep, yep. I think there's Ohio IX, I believe, is another one. I think they're reasonably small. Um, what's that? Oh, is it? Okay. Is that like a co-location facility then? Cool, cool. So you'll see the, um, there's a whole... In the U.S., this is not an exhaustive list, um, but there's a lot of internet exchanges around the U.S., and this is where big organizations will run cable to or buy connectivity to, uh, to to access a whole bunch of other networks. And then they'll run cables to each other and peer, and um, there's a whole like community around peering. It's kind of cool. Nanog um, is, is kind of, uh, I don't know. Anybody even know a Nanog? N North American um, Network Operator Group? Yeah. People just go and talk about peering all day. It's pretty cool. Um, so we've got a bunch of internet exchanges in the US, um, and then we look at it globally, 
you know, there are tons of internet exchanges all around the world. Um, you can see, you know, a lot here. Um, and one thing that's not, um, it's, you'll see a lot on the coast, and that's not by chance. Um, the reason why we see so many internet exchanges on the coast, because if we look at the global internet backbone, this is where all these undersea cables are terminating. So, you know, from Europe, you know, here going to Asia, et cetera. So you'll see a lot of internet exchanges really close to the coast um, to, to terminate this traffic. <coughs> Excuse me. So looking at some of the different times, I really I hit on it a few times, but New York to San Francisco, the the you know the internet can only only go as fast as the speed of light. Um, that's the fastest it can go. And it's 14 milliseconds. But time and fiber, you know, going on a non-direct path and losing a little bit of quality in the fiber, it's about 21 milliseconds. Um, which again isn't a long time. But if you're doing hundreds of requests and transferring a lot of large objects, it can actually add up really really quickly. Um, so New York to London, 28 milliseconds. New York to Sydney, you know, Australia, 80 milliseconds. And to go all the way around the world, about 200 milliseconds um, for a packet to travel in fiber all the way around the world. Perfect, perfect scenario. Um, so just some, in, some internet debugging tools. Um, obviously, we all probably know ping. Um, Traceroute and MTR are really good tools um, for, for, for mapping out the path that your path is taking, your packet is taking. Um, um, so throughput information, IP traff, and NTOP are, are also pretty useful tools as well. Um, so lastly, we'll talk about ICMP, um, the Internet Control Message Protocol. Again, this is, as I mentioned before, this is a layer three protocol. Uh, and it's commonly used when there are issues on layer three. Um, so it's a way for all those devices, all those many dozens of routers that your packet's going to travel, to still be able to communicate back to the client or whoever sent that packet that has an issue. It's a way for them to, um, to message back that something's wrong. Um, so these are a few of them. Um, uh, you know, we all probably know Echo and uh, Reply. Ping, like this is all it's doing is sending out an ICMP echo, and then the server is replying back. Another one that we might see is um, packet too big, um, where along the way one of the routers has a maximum transmission unit, which is under the in the, the standard of 1500. Um, so it will send back an ICMP packet back to the sender to say the packet's too big. Um, and then we've probably seen destination unreachable again when you try to connect to a server, and then curl says you can't connect. That's because the other side is sending back an ICMP packet um, to, to that client. Um, one important thing, just to get on my soapbox, is a lot of people, for the sake of security, like to disable ICMP going into or out of their network. Um, that's a really bad thing, because the internet kind of ceases to function uh, in some ways. So say you're, you know, you have, you know, you're, you're live streaming some video, and all of a sudden, your packets take a different way because BGP changes. Now your packet's too big. That's never going to be received by the client end, so it doesn't know. It has no idea that its packets are being dropped. It'll eventually close the connection and do something else. So um, that's one thing I see a lot. Um, it's not security to disable ICMP. Your internet's going to work a lot better if you enabled it. Cool. Um, some different ICMP. Um, Netstat-SI is really great, and then of course SysStat as well. Um, it can collect a lot of really great stats. So as a site reliability engineer, like. A lot of these things are really important, but I think like one of the things that I think about when I think of an SRE and kind of the superpowers that makes them look like a magical unicorn kind of comes in is taking this data and graphing it and storing it so you can look at a thousand servers. Um, like just going onto a single server and looking at the stuff is is fine if you just you know have a really small infrastructure. But as an SRE who's worked on infrastructures with thousands of servers, I don't care at all about single servers at all. Unless, well, there are some cases where you will, but what I care about is I want to be able to see this across a thousand servers and really dive into that one server or a few servers that are having problems. And so, like, it's really important to use like Grafana or um, you know different. There's tons of different ways to collect this data, but this should be collected periodically and regularly, like less than a minute. I would even recommend so you really have a good idea of what's happening on your infrastructure and building amazing dashboards so that you know what is going on. And specifically, this doesn't, doesn't just relate to networking. Like, as SREs, you know, as infrastructure experts, we should know everything that's going on in the CPU, memory, disk. Um, again, like, just the things that we've talked about today, you should know when there are TCP retransmits. Like, that's a really good indicator that there's something wrong, either on one of the application ends or on the, uh, the internet or the network itself. 
having a bunch of socket stats, like, the, like having, being able to go in and look at every single layer, all the networking layers that we talked about, including instrumenting your application to know when endpoints are failing, to know when you're serving you know, 500s or 400s or whatever. And even remote procedure calls. You know, if your application's down, you want to know, like sometimes those things look like network errors, but really, maybe they're just, you know, the cache is, doesn't have your key or the cache is, is, is not responding or the database is being slow. Um, a lot of these things can look like network errors that really aren't. And I think that's one of the, you know, the roles that, as an SRE that I really try to, to bring to all the things that I work on just have really great instrumentation and data around everything that's happening so we can debug things a lot quicker. So from a networking perspective, the holy grail of networking is TCP IP Illustrated. By far my favorite technical book of all time. It is as dense as it is and as dense as networking is, it makes it really, really approachable. Um, and for folks working on bigger infrastructures, high performance, and even smaller infrastructures, like high performance browser networking was um, written by Ilya from, uh, from Google, talking about how they think about, I, I think the title's actually kind of poor, I don't think it's a great title, but it talks about so many ways in which as infrastructure and web server operators, you can make things you know, more efficient in how they approach these types of problems. And a lot of the, the examples that I, um, or a lot of the content that's in this presentation is in this book, so it's also really, really fantastic. Um, so with that, uh, any questions? Yeah? You didn't mention that ants are uh, usually successful to be high next level for your numbers. Uh, have you ever encountered that in your work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I work, so, I mean, it happens all the time. Um, yes. So, yeah, working at Facebook and, um, so working at these companies, like, too, all, you, you know when all the other companies have issues. Like when Google, you know, when traffic all of a sudden starts going into like, I'm not gonna like be specific, but going into countries that, like taking a really big hairpin outside of, you know, Europe and then like coming back in, like those things are, um, um, those things happen. And, and generally, like one thing that's really cool is the network operators know this stuff. Like they're monitoring this stuff constantly. And I think there's even like a Twitter feed that'll like say, you know, this ASN, this AS might be hijacked or, or whatnot, but um, it definitely happens. Um, I would say more often than not, it happens accidentally. Um, I, I, you know, there is the malicious, which I'm kind of alluding to, but people fat finger, um, you know, they might, you know, might be a small operator and then you announce to um, Comcast the entire internet and then Comcast announces that to the entire internet and then you bring down the internet. It's like things like that happen. Um, so that's the other piece to it, like on the networking side, having really great filtering policies to make sure that your, um, you know, both the way you announce things on the outside are sane, and the people who are announcing to you, you don't, you know, you screw yourself. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, where can we find your slides? Go to patrickshelf.com in like a day or two, and I'll post them there. Okay. And also, where can we obtain that shirt? Um, so this is, I think, Thousand Eyes, um, which I'm not here representing them, but it's just a really cool shirt. But I think. If you go to Thousand Eyes, I don't know how I got it. Um, but yeah, it is a pretty cool shirt. I'm in no way affiliated with them. Cool, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so when I was, um, well, both at Netflix and, and Facebook, um, when you think of those companies, you think of like the big data centers that they have that run all the, the networking, all the, the services, right? And um, like that's one kind of big section of the people who work there. Um, in my role at both Netflix and Facebook on the traffic teams, we owned all the infrastructure outside of the data center. So we own the servers and the networking gear that were in those internet exchanges. Um, and specifically, I worked on the CDN side of that, the, the photo and video delivery. So, um, you know, all the time, like the internet breaks all the time. You know, people backhoe up um, a cable and it might break a big portion of the things that we're doing. So our systems need to respond really fast. So that's why Facebook builds that map of the internet like every minute or two so that we can quickly route around those types of things. Um, but in my role, um, and the other piece to it is I worked on um, a project where we had embedded caches in ISPs. So you know, here in Columbus, like we would work with WOW, Wide Open West, drop servers in there 
data centers, and then we would serve photo and video delivery from those, both at Facebook and, uh, and Netflix. So dealing with those issues is um, a really big part of it. And I think the other probably important piece of context too is like we like I keep I use almost exclusively U.S. examples, but we're doing this like these companies are doing this in Brazil and South America and you know and all these southern Asian countries and it's a lot of um, where the internet connect connectivity is not that great. Um, so this happens quite often, uh, and it's important to build really great tools for again the instrumentation um, and to make sure the the systems automatically you know route away from problem areas. So it happened quite a lot. At a more distributed scale, um, but all those commands I use, like we would collect those all the time and then be able to derive insights from that. So a lot. Yeah. Cool. So the question is, would you can you talk about SLI, SLIs, SLOs, and alerting? Um, so that's service level uh, indicators. indicators. And, uh, what's the reason you put in your chart change? Yeah. So the, I think like to to to. I, I don't know like that specific, like we didn't use that type of terminology, but I think the question is like, how do you know when your service is broken or how do you like set sane thresholds to, um, you know, to keep your service up and running? And um, at both companies, we used a lot of different metrics um, for those. Um, you know, some were just straight thresholds, but one of the, big, like, one of the biggest um, pieces of, of data that I didn't have in this presentation, but all these companies do, when they look at networking, is they look at egress. So the amount of ones and zeros that are leaving your routers at any point in time. And when there's a massive drop in egress, then something's broken. Um, that was actually like one like really big indicator of what's actually wrong. And you can like template that thing out to um, you know, a bunch of different areas and, and different metrics that are important to you. But it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. I'm kind of like, I'm dodging the question, not intentionally. But um, yeah, like that's kind of the art of site reliability engineering is knowing your infrastructure and knowing what's gonna be high signal. You don't want to get woken up in the middle of the night because something dumb broke, right? You want to make sure one, hopefully the robots can, can go fix that themselves um, so you can get more sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you deal with the reality that a lot of people block ICMP? So the question is, how do we deal with the fact that a lot of people um, uh, block ICMP. So some of, there's a lot of different issues that can happen. Um, the one that I mentioned is like MTU changing. Um, there are things you can do on the server side um, it's called um, P -P -MTUD, um, path MTU detection. So if one side actually thinks that the MTU might have changed or their packets are being dropped, it'll actually slowly decrease the MSS, the um, maximum segment size of the TCP packet, to try to get around that. Um, so yeah, it can definitely happen. Like that's just one example, but um, you know you need to think about those those types of things as as you're building this out. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So when I I never took a, a networking class at, at Ohio State. Um, <laughs> it's incredible. I dropped out of CSC six seventy seven, which is I hated it. Like I didn't hate. It. Well, I didn't like it. Um, I, I wasn't going to pass in that class. Um, but but the, the answer is like, at, when I went into Facebook, I was really like coding and, um, and, and operating system heavy. Um, I, jo I joined that team, um, the traffic team, with very little networking knowledge. So these are all things that I've kind of built up over the years. Um, and that's like one thing that's really cool about a company like Facebook is they encourage people to go into areas that they're not experts in and, you know, but still bringing the things that they have to the table and building up that knowledge. Um, so I definitely don't consider myself a networking engineer, even though I come up here and, and talk about this stuff. So, um, yeah, I, 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 but that's one of the things I love doing is just learning and, um, and building things. Um, it's a lot of fun. So, cool. I think that's it. Thank you.